Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Mormon Stories Podcast. I'm your host, John DeLynn. It is January 30th, 2023, and we are here uh, so super excited to plug a new book that's coming out this week, if the if the recording airs when we think it's going to be re- um, aired. The book is Bad Mormon, a memoir by uh, Real Housewives of Salt Lake, the one, the only, Heather Gay. Heather Gay, welcome back to Hi. Mormon Stories. <laughs> I'm kind of having a full circle moment. This is where it all began. <laughs> no, you. I learned from this book that that your your Mormon story began way before you came on Mormon stories. <laughs> yeah, but the vocabulary to articulate that Mormon story really uh, this cracked the seal on the tent. I think for sure. Oh, well, we're honored and we're so thrilled to have you back. I finished the book last night. I think it's a really important book. Totally fun. Totally interesting. Totally compelling. And we're going to be talking about it today. And it's not just us, Heather. There's more. <laughs> we have Margie as my trusted. I feel like uh, with every partner. frame, we should just be holding. Hey, Margie. <laughs> Welcome. Like, Hello. I'm so happy to be here. And if Margie and Heather weren't enough, we have back in studio Dre. Hi. What? I need What's a up, book. Dre? I need a book. <laughs> there we go. Plug it, I'll plug it out. out. Here it is. <laughs> All right. Well, um, the book is Bad Mormon, and uh, of course, Heather Gay is one of the six stars of Real Housewives of Salt Lake. I mean, we're, Lake. we're dropping like flies. The cast oh, is dropping like is flies. Down we're down to four? four right now. Okay. All and right. We'll I guess see what Jen happens Shaw's season in four. Jail, is that right? Jen, in prison or? Jen Shaw's, she's going to surrender herself on February 17th. Oh, oh, that's that's not fun. Okay. All right. Um, we just got serious really quick. <laughs> well, prison tends to do that. Um, yeah. <laughs> Um, so, uh, all right. So yes, but, but how many seasons now? Three seasons? We just finished our third season and we're, um, gearing up for season four to film, you know, in the next few weeks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But season three hasn't fully aired. Is that correct? Season three has fully aired. It's done. Yeah. The final reunion episode aired and yeah, we're done. And for those who, what's that? Thank heavens. Goodbye and good riddance to season three. Oh, Okay. (laughs) Well, uh, you know, it's it's been a real phenomenon, not just here in Utah, but across the country and the world. And so, and for those who haven't been following Mormon stories super closely or who are brand new, by the way, did you guys know that half of our audience has never been Mormon or LDS before? No wow. way. Isn't that crazy? And we just surpassed 100,000 subscribers. So think about that for a second. I mean, that's like a it's... true feat. And I'm so grateful to the yeah. Mormon that's... stories community. Yeah. They've that's been amazing. Yeah, we're yeah. excited. So Huge. anyway... Um, For those who haven't been following us or who are new, Heather and Dre joined us a couple years ago here in this very studio um, to tell their stories. Um, Dre partners with you, Heather, in uh, Love Labs? Beauty Lab. lab. Well, Beauty Lab. It is a lab. It is a love lab. Let's articulate that a little more clearly. Our podcast is Live Love Lab. Okay. Yes, our podcast is Live Love Lab, but we're business partners. That's right. And and because of that, in many ways, partners in life. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, when we came on Mormon Stories, that was my birthday gift. From Heather, yeah. it's like <laughs> was my dream come has true. its perks, <laughs> oh. and it really did like turn the tide, don't you think? Absolutely, yeah. it was the tipping point for all things housewives, and for me emotionally and personally, and in my ability to really, for the first time ever, own my story. I wasn't to the point where I could respect it yet, but I could own it, and that was the first time I ever said it out loud. So, wow. Mormon stories. I understand now why. Dre was such a devotee of Mormon stories and encouraged it to me over and over and over. And I can't believe I was so resistant to it, so afraid of it. And that to me was evidence of the indoctrination that anything not positive is, you know, circling the drain to hell. Well, I am a scary guy. <laughs> I, know. I mean, if there's a bad Mormon, it might be me. <laughs> you are. The, I think you are the ultimate <laughs> the bad OG. Mormon. You. Were you the that's first you. bad Mormon? I mean, not technically, the first, John, the, the way you live, you're still just a bad Mormon. That's really it. <laughs> Do you but, have to drink alcohol to be a bad Mormon or can you be a sober? You can be a bad Mormon just by <laughs> belonging, but never being accepted. I was going to say, Mormonism faith. makes that yeah. really easy. Yeah, <laughs> actually. To totally. Be a bad Mormon. All right. Well, enough about that. We're we're so excited to just dig into your amazing book. 
Dre, you are welcome to jump in. Kind of is the Robin Givens, what is it, of um, Howard Stern? Perfect. Okay. okay. Well, we can I say Batman and Robin, but sure, I'm Howard Stern in this scenario. <laughs> Lovely. If I thought I was a bad Mormon before, I know it now. And hey, you are my Robin Givens. Love it. I'll take it. I'll yeah. try to be a little less vulgar. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no need, no need. Um, I was going to say, too, quick plug for Dre, because Dre did her own interview in her own of right, course. too. Well, they interviewed so together. The so, thrive. Yeah. But then but she I did the thrive thrive story. Story. Oh, and the Thrive Story. I'm so, yeah, the with Margie. Can the I just say? Story. I'm a, I'm her story. We're invisible <laughs> women. We are invisible. <laughs> her okay. story is beautiful. <laughs> Thank you, Margie. So yeah. we can add that as part Dre's of that. Dre's Thrive Story was amazing. Uh -huh. yeah. Like, she's worth knowing amazing about. Amazing so. Thrive Robert. book coming out soon <laughs> with Dre on the cover. Dre, my brain is scrambled eggs. So. And I will join it's you, Dre, good. for that you podcast. You do a lot of these, John. I do. Wait too many. I and so, yeah, Julie's going to add that to the show notes, Dre's uh, amazing Thrive story as well. Anyway, so glad you're here. Should we dive in? Yeah, let's dive in. Okay, so this book, uh, a memoir coming out in February 2023, um, is about your story, and uh, I loved it, and... You know, the basic premise is that you were a bad Mormon, but a bad Mormon, I'm going to say that in quotes, but uh, there's a twist at the end that I'm really excited to explore. So what I thought we would do is go through kind of each phase, and the book is broken up into like five five uh, different sections or chapters, maybe six, but yeah. bad daughter, bad missionary, bad wife, bad Mormon, and bad ass. Sorry for the swear. Love that. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, not sorry. Sorry, not sorry. Um, but I thought what we would do is go through each section and touch on how you failed the church, but maybe how the church failed you in each of those eras. How does, how does that, that sound? sound? That sounds great. Is that all right? Sounds fabulous. And so the way we, I lived it, that's the way we should discuss it. Yeah. And then maybe at the end, we can talk about some... Legal intrigue yes. that, that is worth discussing. That's part of the badass section. I mean, yeah. Dre and my attorney, Casey, are part of the badass section that have really empowered me to yeah. press forward with all of it. Beautiful. All right. Well, let's just jump in. And and Margie, of course, I'm so grateful you're here. And Dre, jump in at any time. Um, okay. So, Heather, uh, there actually, Margie, there are a couple stories you wanted Heather to maybe even retell. And of course, you can read from your book at any point you want to just okay. read. There's some parts that are just so incredibly readable. Margie, you, you had a couple moments in the book that uh, were really important to you. But maybe maybe to begin, Heather, do you want to just give a super brief background of like your parents and your your upbringing, yeah. just like in a minute or two to kind of yeah, frame I it? Yeah, I mean, this and and you can state any intention you want to share about why you're here today and what why you wrote the book. Okay, mm. well, I wrote the book, and the reason I'm here today is because I came here in the first place. <laughs> I came to Mormon Stories for the first time, told my story, and then in many ways wanted to put pen to paper and write that story out, not only for me, but for my daughters and for, if I was gonna upturn, you know, 10 generations, or I don't know how many generations, five generations of ox cart pioneers and mm -hmm. firm in the faith, I wanted to make sure that I left no stone unturned and that I, you know, told it from my perspective, the way I experienced it with, you know, no sensationalism. I just wanted to write it down and see what it looked like. But um, yeah, I grew up Mormon and struggled. I always belonged, but I never was really accepted. And I think that's an important distinction. You know, belonging doesn't necessarily being accepted. And I think that that is, applies to people that aren't just Mormon, but in every corner of the world in any high demand insular community or family, high demand family or high demand expectations, you know, where you belong somewhere, but you're not necessarily ever going to be accepted unless you let the most precious parts of you die. And that's kind of the narrative of Bad Mormon. And I really wrote it just for representation and visibility for the people that walk away. Our stories are never really told with the perspective they should be, you know, they're demonized or they are erased, erased. Yeah. And it sounds like you're not going to be erased. <laughs> well, for the longest time I wanted to be, you know, uh, mm. I just wanted to disappear. But now that I have this opportunity, especially with housewives, I feel like I owe it to all the people that sustained me and got me through and over the hard, hard, you know, stumbling blocks of obligation and duty to God that were really 
not real, you know? Yeah. You know how Jerry mm-hmm. always says to me, sounds made up. And yeah. it's crazy how thoughts can really imprison you, you know? Totally, yeah. totally. Beautiful. Tell us really quickly about your your parents and kind of where you were raised in the, in your childhood before you came to Utah. Yeah, I mean, I, I was born in California, lived in um, Colorado for the most part of my life, then moved to Utah when I was uh, 15. And... Uh, graduated from high school in Utah, went to BYU, went on a mission, got married and uh, did everything, all the Mormon milestones, one would say. And my family was devoutly Mormon, but really cool. And my extended family, both my parents, pioneer stock, ox cart pioneers converted to the gospel in um, England, came over, sold everything they had, rode over on ships and then did the trek across the Plains. They settled Plain City, um, Utah, and American Fork, Utah. Robinson Park is named after my great 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 grandfather, and uh, the roots run deep. They run deep, and I've always been deeply, deeply proud of them, and felt an obligation to perpetuate that same legacy. And the the main family names? Um, it's Carver Hinchcliffe uh, McLean on my mother's side, and it's C. Strand Robinson Chipman on my father's side. Okay. William Henry Chipman uh, had three wives and was part of the, you know, some of the original trekkers across yeah. the plains. So your dad had an interesting profession that I think is going to play into a couple of questions Margie's going to ask. Do you want to talk about that? Sure. My dad uh, worked for the FBI. And worked and then parlayed that career into um, Bureau of Land Management and then parlayed that into oil and gas <laughs> leasing and then um, uh, got was an entrepreneur, kind of a perennial entrepreneur. And then after he retired, went back to school and became a high school teacher, which I think was probably his greatest mm. love and legacy oh, Wow! And being a teacher, I which I didn't really get into in the book because I tried to really just tell my story from my perspective and not not appropriate anyone's stories or experiences because that felt like what has happened to me for my whole life, you yeah. know? So. Yeah. Beautiful. Your mom was kind of a, is glam Mormon a right word? Like what's the way to describe your mom's vibe, especially growing up? You know, my mom was one of the 10% that do everything. You know how they're those women that are, yeah. they have the great kids, they have the, cre- they're creative, they're smart, they make young women's activities fun, they make their primary lessons fun. If they're choir leader, you know, they have the best felt boards and the lyrics. And she was just supremely competent at all things creative. I think she was a wonderful writer. I think she was a musician. She could sing alto anywhere, anytime. She knew all the words. So she was just, she wasn't glamorous as much as she was just a super mom. Mm. Yeah. Sounded like she was just excellent. Yeah. That's so much of what excellent she did. Excellent at being a mother to six children. Yeah. And what did it mean? What What were the manifestations of being the perfect Mormon mom for your mom? Like how did it show in the home? I mean, magical Christmases, magical Easter's, like Sunday dresses, you know, curled hair, uh, being in the road show, my mom writing the lyrics for the road show, you know, my mom, you know, being up there teaching primary or in young women, she brought like gummy bear, little pop bead necklaces for everybody and helped design these sweatshirts that looked like paper dolls. You know, she just, she just had that extra, you know, she was fun and funny and didn't take herself too seriously, but worked hard, you know, worked hard to cultivate the home. You know, we had every Valentine's day, there was like curly ribbon attached to the chandelier to a gift on our plate. You know, there were scavenger hunts. (laughs) Every birthday felt special. You know, she just, hit all the top line marks. So those memories of childhood are really embedded, just the top notes. You know, I don't remember a lot of pain as a child, uh, you know? I feel like I had an idyllic childhood. Yeah, I was gonna say the thing that I thought also that was so um, impactful to me about your mom is it wasn't just like she did all the like what would I say the external things like the things that show up at church you know when you're looking around to be like a but she also did all the like you can't get away oftentimes in the role of mom from just also laundry like meals and and she was there for all of that too that is just it is so much to hold 
for a human being. So it's all, yes, the external, all those extra, extra mom things, right. but also took equally seriously all the mundane. Yeah, the unpaid daily, labor. The magic of daily life too. Yeah, she nurturing. had like a food storage system with where the cans rolled down and we had to pick up the cream of chicken soups and bring them upstairs. You know, she had the laundry baskets with our names and the sock pile. And we all, she just ran us through all of those tasks and just the amount of work to not only do it herself, but like, micromanage all of the kids. I just, I would never have the capacity, emotional, yeah. physical at all. I don't know how that generation did it without yeah. just, I don't know, dying inside or self-medicating. I don't, it's yeah. very intense. There's a major theme in your book about women becoming kind of working moms and professionals. And I know your, your business collaboration kind of exemplifies that. Having said that, Margie, having been your partner when you were a stay-at-home mom and not working outside the home, there's a lot that we can say about how hard it is to be a working mom. In some ways, being a stay-at-home mom not working can be harder. Does that resonate at all? I mean, I think it's all hard. I think being a mom <laughs> is hard. Yeah. yeah. And it is a job that we... Um, feel, you know, it's just so hard and it's harder when you work outside and have to, it just, and it's harder. There's there, it's all hard. Yeah. It's hard staying home. It's hard working right. outside the home. I think it is harder probably to do both because you, it just because you're being simulated outside the home doesn't mean that any of the pressures go away. It's just that you're feeding a tiny corner of your soul. Whereas before you mm, might be starving, but the workload you know, multiplies. I know sometimes it's almost like you add, you, yeah, you you're just adding, add to it. Yeah. You're, it's like you're, you're still, someone's going to climb Mount Everest just because they need that fulfillment when they get to the peak. It's like you are in it, you know, you're knee deep, you're sludging through, but you know that the reward is what you're there for. So you kind of sludge through it. Would you agree? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what did, how did Mormonism manifest itself in your home in terms of like, if someone were to walk into your home and experience how Mormonism was lived in your home, what would be the Mormon elements of your childhood? They, I mean, I didn't even know Mormonism was the center of my universe, just like the sun. I didn't know how the sun rose or what it meant to other planets or what it meant to people on the other side of the world. It was just my entire universe all of our friends, all of our associates are, they would walk into our home and they would just think we were an all American, wonderful family. There might be, I mean, we had like a cool matted framed picture of uh, Kirtland, Ohio, when it was first organized. And then a tiny portrait of Joseph Smith with some of his original money, which now to me is so overtly Mormon. But back then I thought of it as like museum art, like, American history. I didn't understand the distinction between Mormon history or Mormon money and America. So I thought I was Joseph Smith, my beloved prophet was, you know, was equal to George Washington. So we would have little relics of, but mostly just family pictures. And, you know, we didn't have a picture of the temple. We didn't have, we just lived like a great, normal American family. Did There'd guys, be food and the house would smell good. It'd be clean. And did you do the family prayer scripture study? Singing, yeah, we did scripture singing. study. I mean, for ourselves privately, we did scripture study and we would have family prayers and we'd pray before meals and we just, you know, but I didn't even think we were supremely religious. You know, I just thought we were God fearing, God loving family, Right. you know, Norman Rockwell. Yeah. I thought Norman Rockwell was a Mormon. Of course he's a Mormon. <laughs> he did those paintings of the mom with the kid, you know, at the drugstore and the dad and the yeah. the postman and the dog eating an ice cream cone. You know, I thought Jesse Wilcox Smith was Mormon. I thought all these, if an artist drew a mother and a child, I just, it was the center of my universe. It was the only faith. It was the only religion. I do didn't think anything ex existed outside of it that would have been more important or more valid. Yeah. And it was the ideal, you know, it totally worked. It was ideal. Yeah. It was like what you were shooting for. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Tell the story about the soccer match that your dad got into a little 
Okay. Tussle. A little, a, a kerfuffle. <laughs> yeah. A kerfuffle at the soccer match. And if you want to read it, read parts of um, it, you can, or if you just want to tell the story. Yeah, why don't I read a little bit? Okay. So I'll, I'll, while you're looking for it, I'll just say. I know exactly so- where it is. Match. We can frame it. Yeah, you want to know? <laughs> I, I kind of feel okay. like, and this goes really yeah. well, I feel like with what you're saying, Heather, this idea that you had this really insular idealized version of how the world works. And I thought for me reading the story, this is like a moment where there's something from the outside that comes in that allows you to see that some, it, it's not exactly, people see it differently than you do. Yeah. People experience Mormonism. it a little. Mormonism. 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 Yeah. And they expose you to a reality that like you never understood was even bad. Exactly. You know, like I, I didn't have any concept that the underwear that my parents wore was any different than underwear that every parent wore. (laughs) Yes. And there were things that confirmed that because there were men that wore kind of weird tank tops under their dress shirts that you'd see occasionally. And then my mom would look for the garment line. And I just, I knew that other people didn't wear garments because we always would look for garment lines. But I guess I thought, um, those were bad people. And that was a way for us to know not to, you know, like mm-hmm. stay away from guys in van- windowless vans and <laughs> guys that don't have garments on, you know, danger, <laughs> danger, a, yeah, stranger danger. And this is, my dad was, you know, a cool dad and he was funny and people loved him and he was our soccer coach. And, um, I was the only Mormon on the team and I, uh, knew that. And so I was always on my best behavior because I was so proud to be the only Mormon and to be the best. So I wanted to live up to it, you know, and I have the great dad that never says, damn it, under his breath or spikes a soccer ball and is the one that brings treats and cheers us on, you know, and yeah. gives us this. So I had the cool dad that I was, and I had so no, he wasn't the fight with other parents at the soccer match. No, time. I mean, he was an intense sideline coach, of course. And this is where this happened. But I think that this was the only time, like, I really saw my dad uh, argue with anyone openly like that ever. And it was, but it wasn't the fight because that felt just like normal soccer yeah. game. I mean, soccer games back then, baseball games back then, they were the wild, wild west. Yeah. But it was the slur that he hurled at my dad that totally shattered my naivete that it like I, penetrated your reality. Yeah. Right? And I felt shameful. Like, you know, not only were they talking about my dad's underwear, but Let's some, read it. something weird's going on. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm going to take a sip of and this water. Is really from, uh, this is from bad Mormon yeah. a memoir. And PS, I turned right Heather to Gray. it. It's page 29, which is my birth date, 629. <laughs> <laughs> it's meant to be. Oh. I mean, I, you could tell me any story and I could point to the page because for the first time I have a story now and I love that it exists and I can oh. refer to it. I'm not going to get emotional except for every other word. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I'll never know or be brave enough to ask anyone what started the fight on the sidelines that day. My dad was probably challenging a bad ref call or calling out a heel raise on a throw in. Whatever was considered normal banter and parental sideline coaching in the 1980s would get you thrown off the field and kicked off the team in today's safe sideline spectator rule book. Voices were raised and the background chatter grew silent. Suddenly, as I was running down the field in my perforated double ply polyester, I became aware that the kerfuffle on the sidelines involved my dad and that everyone was watching. I saw him roll his eyes, shake his head from side to side, and mumble as he began to storm off. As soon as his back was turned, the other parent yelled out, That's right, take your daughter and your funny underwear and go home. The blood rushed to my ears and time stood still. Funny underwear? My dad flipped around and charged at the man, grabbing his t-shirt with both hands. He was raging. The other guy braced himself and they stood there heaving and holding each other at arm's length like two elks with their horns interlocked. A few bystanders shouted at them to knock it off as concerned parents on the sidelines quickly separated them. My dad's comb over had been shaken in the altercation and while his friends pulled him away from the fracas, he smoothed his hair back into place and muttered angrily, never looking away from the man he was forced to retreat from. What had this guy said? Why was he teasing my dad about something as stupid as underwear? My dad didn't wear funny underwear. 
My dad wore garments. He was prone to sporting a one-piece romper with a back flap, perhaps not really a flap so much as overlapping fabric that created a closed effect until you bent over, pulled the two overlaps apart in order to use the bathroom. It was exactly like my mom's garments, except hers were made of a silky material and had lace trim. That's the only underwear I had ever seen them wear, but I had never really thought of it as something to make fun of. And more important, why did this guy care about my dad's underwear? I had been folding my parents' garments in the laundry for nearly a decade. It was just underwear to me. I didn't know there was anything unusual about it. None of us did. When my little brother came across an advertisement in the Sears catalog for children's long johns, he was overjoyed. Mom, Dad, look, he squealed, running into their bedroom with the pictures displayed. Garments for kids. (laughs) That was was one of my favorite lines. I texted you. I texted you when I read that line. I I mean, we joke about it still as a family. Like, oh, how funny. Garments for kids. But we wanted garments, too. We didn't even know. We just thought when you became an adult, you wore garments. Mm-hmm. When it's the water you swim in as a Mormon, you think you think it's just super normal, right? Yeah. You also mentioned you. There's this wonderful scene in the book where you talk about doing the Hosanna shout because the Denver Temple. Yeah, it was opens dedicated up while you're living there, and you do the. Do you want to talk about doing the Hosanna shout? I mean, the Hosanna <laughs> shout. Do you want to tell? I, do I tell our non-Mormons what that is? So, well, the Hosanna shout to a non-Mormon would be. A ritual chant done in mass, staring straight ahead with a Kleenex, with a Kleenex <laughs> over your head, like, and it's a, it's a, it's like a flat, it's a rhythmic chant, and Hosanna. I don't know if I feel comfortable you don't doing have to. it no, here, you don't have to. but <laughs> because it's pretty culty, yeah, and it's even cultier, you know, if you're a thirteen-year-old going. Like, and everyone's staring straight ahead going, Hosanna, Hosanna. You know, that's freaking weird. And the lamb, right? And that's, those were words that were sacred to me. That was the spirit of God is like a fire is burning. Those were hymn lyrics. And I had never seen anyone chant in church. I had never seen anyone use, you know, speak to God directly. And it felt terrifying in a way because there was no opportunity to be like, what are we doing here? Somebody explain. It was just like, you look at your parents, you look at in the room, you look straight ahead at the prophet and he's just going, Hosanna, Hosanna, you know? And it is scary because you realize, well, you know, don't mess with this. I mean, you're, that's a, it's like watching witches do a spell, you know, I'm going to use this to... (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> for what it's meant to use. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and the thing about that, if you compare it or contrast it a little bit with garments where you kind of, you grow up from the time you're little, you know, having your parents watching them knowing that they wear garments. But with the temple, there's a this removed, right? So you grow up and it's like a mystery. You hear about it, but you don't know, uh, you know, my, but we know it's the pinnacle. We know everything important, right? It, yes. Happens in the temple. So you had no exposure to, to this temple kind of, so to have it completely out of context, no, it gave you like a different perspective. Right. Where you were like, whoa, wait. And it didn't feel spiritual. The temple and never I am, did for you. Yeah. Doing the Hosanna shout does not feel spiritual. Yeah. It feels culty. Yeah. That's hard to say, right? Yeah. It's painful to say because you tell yourself, if it feels weird to you, it's because you're full of sin. So purify and purge yourself of these doubts because clearly you need to get over that hump so that you can get to the other side where everyone else is in this spiritual bliss and they're feeling the spirit of God enter the room and enter their hearts. And, you know, I was taught to be so kind of subdued about my religion in a lot of ways. Like, you know, don't point out your garments, look happy and normal But then when we get behind these closed doors where everyone has told me your soul will be enlightened, you'll commute, God is present. And as soon as God enters the room, we're saying the same words over and over. We're chanting and we're separated men and women and we're wearing weird outfits. That's where God, so why am I going to church and why am I told that personal prayer is important? And if what's important is me doing ritual. Yeah. 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 It's disappointing. 
Yeah. But instead of feeling disappointed, you feel ashamed and you feel lazy, a lazy learner. I'm not disciplined. I should find meaning. I mean, I would try to find meaning in those names on those cards that they'd give you in the temple. I would think, oh, her middle name has an H. This is someone that asked me to do her work for her. And I'm so glad I didn't go out with my friends or, you know, stay home with my children that I'm here in the temple. Just for put, an endowment? Yeah, yeah, putting on robes or doing these things for this woman who's just in heaven weeping and watching behind the veil for this sacred event so that she can also now be with God. And now that I'm out of it, I'm like, God loves her. He's not going to be like, listen. I put it on Heather Gay. She screwed up. <laughs> what can I tell you? You know, but that is the pressure we feel. But That's it's right. apophenia, right? Like looking for meaning. Yeah. Yeah. In, oh, searching for meaning in things that may or may not have meaning, but yeah. Yeah. And in know. college, we realized that my, my devout Mormon roommates realized that and we called it MTB and we would mock people that would use what the apophenia meant to be. Oh. Because we'd see people making foolish choices or getting married after a week or, you know, getting pregnant. They're on their honeymoon because it was meant to be. God wanted this to happen. God wanted, you know, me to get in a car accident so that I could meet the end, you know, and it was everything meant to be. And we would mock mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. But the truth was we had to draw a, board, a barrier so that we could make sure that we weren't that crazy. Yeah. But that's what I kind of talk about. Like the line started to slip, you know, especially when you go through the temple and you see the rituals you're making. And by the way, we're, we're getting the watered down rituals. Yeah. The I rituals the my stuff. parents took <laughs> me too. would have made me scared to talk to my kids too. You mentioned the the throat slitting with the thumb in the book. Well, a the, the throat, the tongue ripped out from its root. Yeah. Yeah. That's, the you know, things, stuff. things that my, those were the oaths my parents made. And, so of course they're not going to kneel down when yeah. their kid asks a question about their green apron and say, honey, it's really just symbolic. And let's talk about it because I'm sure they wanted their tongues attached to their heads. Yeah. You know, I'm sure they didn't want to disembowel yeah. themselves yeah. for speaking of these things outside the temple. Yeah. And, and for me, that was one of the really powerful, profound parts of the book is how you wove the temple ceremony all throughout the book. You mentioned the sure sign of the nail, even mm. at the very last chapter of your book. And it's really, it's really, really powerful. You yeah. revisit it multiple times yeah. and I won't, I won't because give you, too many spoilers. But, but if you think about it, the sure sign of the nail or the patriarchal grip has had a, a stronger hold on me than mm. any other tenant of my life. Mm. And in it's like we are always saying, like fight the patriarchy. The patriarchal grip is what kept me connected to my family, to my faith, to my you know ex, uh, salvation, and to my personal relationship with God. And in its name, it's a patriarchal grip. Why aren't we even questioning that? Yeah. yeah. You want to say we're, my friends want to come at me and say I'm an equal in my marriage. I'm an equal in this church. You are wrong. You are confused. You are too sensitive. Honey, the patriarchal grip yeah. is what governs every choice you make. And it is only through that patriarchal grip that you get to get into heaven. And so it's named do patriarchal. Not, do not call yourself a feminist. Yeah. Yeah. I will not get on the KKK train and call myself an anti-racist. Yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? I think mm. that alone, if words have power That's good. and words have power in this book, then change the grip that gets us into heaven to the divine grip from God <laughs> and not the patriarchal grip. Wow. And maybe not even a grip. How why about, are, yeah, how about not we, a grip? Why are we how about grabbing? a loving exactly. rope pull? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> like, what did you say, Dre? A caress. A caress. Yeah, yeah. Ca well, caress gets <laughs> creepy too. Let's be honest. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Heather, um, I want to, I, there's so much to cover, but I want to go back to your childhood really quickly. The, the scene that has to do with your baptism and the bathroom. Mm. I really want you to retell. You, you can just tell it yourself. If you want to re reference the book, you can, but Margie, you had mentioned wanting to set this up or. Yeah. Well, these, there were a couple things that were kind of related to me. The first was the story you told, um, about cutting the curtains and Did I ever tell it or. Um, I don't, it's up to you. The, we can tease the curtain. Okay. Yeah. It's one of my favorite stories. Yes, in the whole I really I love, love that. So There's a, there is a part of you that I recognized in that story where, um, 
you know, in short, I'll, I'll just summarize and then say the framing for me. Yeah. But in short, it's kind of like both your parents come home, cut curtain, uh, you are playing and trying to do a robot kind of thing. <laughs> I it was being up, creative, right? Margie, and, and creative. Devel- and developmentally appropriate. <laughs> Exploring, yes. Imagination, creativity. And um, they come home and really question, question, question. And you are committed to like, nope. Nope, wasn't me. Nope, even though all the signs. But amidst that, what I loved, you made a statement that was really funny about the robot having... I, I did not lie. I did not cut that. The robot had a malfunction. Yes, the or, robot pincer had a malfunction. <laughs> but the Talk thing... Talk to the robot. Yes. And But the pressure of that, the pressure of... The, uh, and the connection lost and your absolute... There was something in you in that moment mm-hmm. that I recognized that was really moving to me. Um, a piece of you that was just sort of relentless to yourself. But the greater message that I related to is this perfectionism, this idea of um, as children, the pressure we feel to not make mistakes to, you know, that was completely developmentally appropriate with your baptism story. Mm -hmm. That's another like example, which you can tell, but the framing for me is just the intense pressure and what happens internally to us as children when we feel that love is always like, um, you know, yes, like one step away, one action away from being taken, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's what I really felt from that. That was really impactful to me. But I don't know if you want to go over that. I feel like a lot of people will relate to the baptism story. Well, I think that it, I mean, let me just pull the room here. We're all bad Mormons here. (laughs) I mean, do you all remember the first lie or the first dark black mark on your slate after your baptism? Do you remember the first thing you did bad? For me, it was a thought. It was a thought. Yeah, because okay. thoughts are sins. In yeah, yeah, that's right? what I'm saying. But you know what? It, you, I it thought was a, a bad word. Yeah. You thought, thought a bad, a bad word. word. You that thought, darn mine. it, yeah, John. No, you thought, shit, darn it. Shit, that's probably shit. <laughs> oh, John. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm just being honest. Is that too Margie, much for you? Did I ever Margie, love you? Did no, ever... Margie, what was yours? I remember it was it was a lie. And it, and how I felt, and that's what I I felt from you was how pivotal it is for a, ch- a child to think they can be clean, and then in one move be dirtied, ruined soiled. It. I ruined, ruined it. it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What was yours? Do you remember? Yours? I don't remember what it was, but I remember being nervous to take the sacrament. It was literally <laughs> mm-hmm. the week after my baptism, and like viscerally remember, like oh no. I hope that I can take the sacrament. I hope I've repented enough. I hope that I'll be clean again. And yeah. I mean, absolutely. It was so real. So real. Well, I'll do, should I read mine? Yeah, if mm-hmm. you want. Yeah. So yeah. While, while she's checking, this is Heather reading about a baptism and a post-baptism experience from her book, Bad Mormon, a memoir published by Simon and Schuster. It's a wonderful book. There's an audio version of the book as well. I listened to the audio version and thankfully, Heather herself narrates it. Also, while she's looking, one of the things I really love about this book is all the pop culture and music references. So, Heather, yes. while you're looking for this, I'm just going to throw it out here that I this have one's a harder to list. find because it's embedded in yeah. Ashley's. Ba- no, so it's I have to go back. I'm, yeah, I'm, but I'm I got it. I got but it. Also, okay. there's something substantive here. Okay. I have a dream, a bucket Thank list you. to karaoke with you two. Because I didn't realize you loved music as much as you do. Oh, Monday night karaoke at the Highlander yeah, on absolutely. Highland Drive. You guys, you guys karaoke at the Highlander? I've yes. Been there. Oh, yeah. We're not going to go far for, for All right. karaoke. <laughs> All right, I'm in. Okay. What's your karaoke song? Oh, I do Vienna by Billy Joel. That's one of my. Oh, you know, I love. You know I just felt <laughs> unreserved affection for you. That's a layer I didn't know of your onion that I had not filled back. That's, What's yours? What's your go-to Well, mine song? is I like Pop and Don't Preach, Ooh, but I love Madonna. a duet with Dre. Any oh. duet Dre will do with me. How about you, Margie? I would love to see What's that. What's yours? We just did, we were in Mexico together and we... Oh, we did George Michael. Faith. 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 Oh, by George Michael. That's a good Look at us, you guys. We shaked, I mean, our, we shaked our booties. <laughs> that's right. We had to, like we did George the opener where he does the. You got to have faith. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay. So that's a bucket list. All right, Heather. Um, I do want to mention, too, that Heather has a playlist on Spotify for the book where all of the songs that are referenced in the book are on, you know, a central playlist. And it is pure fire. I listen to it all the time. It's like the playlist for the book. So this is from this 
chapter that we're reading right now is Somewhere That's Green, which is, of course, from Little Shop of Horrors. I'm a huge show tunes girl, and it's when... Um, Audrey is singing about all she wanted was just like a little plot of land, a picket fence, plastic on the furniture, you know, somewhere that's green. Mm. And I am in the midst of the dark times of my marriage. My daughter's about to be baptized. I am planning this perfect, perfect baptism. And I'm setting up how important it is to me that her baptism be monumental um, not only for her, but for my own identity as her mother and a good Mormon mother. And then I reflect back on my own um, baptism. Okay. I remember every part of my baptism down to my first lie. The first mark of sin on your perfect clean slate is a milestone a Mormon never forgets. You come out of the font as clean as the white towel you're wrapped in, and you want to stay that way. But as it turns out, it's really hard to stay perfect. A few hours after my own baptism, I was using the bathroom, and my dad accidentally opened the door. Lock the door next time, he scolded. I did, I retorted too quickly and without thinking. Silence. His response pierced my eight-year-old heart. You just told your first lie. I ruined it two hours in and I ruined it. My stomach fell to my toes as I walked, as I, as I sulked, sorry. My stomach fell to my toes as I sulked in the quiet solitude of the unlocked bathroom, too afraid to even lift my head and face my reflection in the mirror. I wanted Ashley to remember more than her first lie at her baptism. I wanted her to remember how much I loved her. I wanted her. To, I wanted to create enough happiness around her and the event to distract from the holes in my own heart. And so I made it a white party modeled after Kyle Richards herself. White everything. Mm. <laughs> yes. So as a child, you, you probably felt pretty intensely that need to not only be perfect externally, but spiritually, morally perfect as well, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Perfect in every way. I got a, I got to start over fresh at eight. <laughs> Remember how great that felt? We're, we're clean, white, everything. And I think subconsciously I wanted to do what maybe a lot of parents do is make the event so mo monumental for Ashley that she would feel that internal pressure to honor it mm. with, you know, being good. I don't think that was ever a conscious thought, but when I think about huge missionary farewells for missions, you know, Billy came home, my ex-husband came home early from his mission and he said to me, you know, I always wonder if I had had a huge missionary farewell, if I had had the huge banquet and gotten all the money and all the checks that I probably would have stayed out of obligation. But he kind of went while his parents were away and it was just like a sacrament meeting and not a lot of fanfare. And so he, it, he didn't feel a lot of pressure to stay. And I don't know if that made an imprint on me, but I look around at my families and I see we do these pictures of the missionaries with the flag and the Book of Mormon and the cookies with Argentina, you know, and the, the big, huge fanfare. And guess what? That is pressure to, to stay. Mm -hmm. You have a million dollar wedding. You're not walking out after six weeks. You know, mm -hmm. I think that we do that a lot and we create it so that uh, it's a big deal, which makes, you know, just digs us in a little bit deeper. Um, let's jump to adolescence really quick. I want to really want to get to a BYU story, but um, do you want to talk about, I, you know, you eventually moved from Denver to, to Utah. I think you grew up in Holiday. Is that yeah, right? Yeah, in Holiday, just around the corner. Yeah, Murray Holiday Road here. Where we are. Um, do you want to talk about worthiness interviews and your bishop and chat, law of chastity and kind of how that all played for you, especially growing up in a super Mormon high school in Utah? Yeah, I mean... It was, it was different, the chastity interviews, because you really start having interviews at the age of eight, you know, where you are um, in a, alone in a room with a man and asked to, you know, respond to all the questions about everything, dirty thoughts, stealing candy, you know, not obeying your parents. And so I had already learned and mastered the kind of that choreography of the interview, you know, on the ones where there's a little gray, like, are you respecting your mom and dad? You know, you just, you know, you do the grimace and the sigh and I'm really trying Bishop, you know, but then you just, but you know, to just, and then when they get to the hard ones, like, you know, are you having immoral thoughts? No, 
you know, then, then they've built, you have a little credibility so you can get through those. And like, you knew not to answer too quickly. You knew not to answer, you know, to give them any. And I, I, I knew how to get through those. I don't think I ever on any occasion intended to ever really be honest because I was too afraid. Were you, you hiding know? things from your bishop? Yeah, because that bishop was my, you know, best friend's dad. <laughs> you know, and that bishop knew my, was best friends with my dad. And that bishop saw me every Sunday. And that bishop, so if I read a section of Twin Peaks that talked about a girl trying to, you know, pleasure herself with a faucet, and I had tried on multiple <laughs> occasions to slide my butt down so it would work, <laughs> it didn't work. I mean, it didn't work. And so I thought, why waste his time with that? Because it was also my deepest, darkest, yeah. most painful sin. Yeah. And did he want me to tell him that? Did he want me to tell him that I was trying to figure out the physical mechanics of a bathtub faucet two inches away from the wall and my body? You know what I mean? Like, yeah. and so I learned to dance around it. But then I had a specific interview where uh, he pressed in and said he was inspired by God to ask me about touching myself. And of course, all of those times you've skated around anything, you think, well, this is the real bishop. This is the one that's inspired. This is God. God had time for me today in this moment. You know, We're taught to believe it's such a personal connection. And so you're not sure if it's kind of a battle of wits. You know, How are we going to get through this? So you tell him a little, mostly to pander to his ego a lot of the time, you know, and especially where they say, I feel inspired that swearing has been a problem for your friends and you're worried about it. You'd say it has been, it hasn't. You're just pandering to his ego. You also don't want to deny the fact that he's inspired. It's apophenia. Yeah, what are you you're going to say looking like, for no, confirmation. Yeah. Like Bishop, you're dead, dead ass wrong on that one. Nope. Try again, try <laughs> again, try again. You just don't do that. So I just remember getting asked specifically about touching myself over and over and he just wouldn't let it go. And it was so uncomfortable that I made stuff up, not about that, but like about boys and just enough to be like, oh, Bishop, I'm so glad you're inspired so that I could get this off my chest. And I did not feel relief. I did not feel uh, forgiven. I felt ashamed. I felt labeled and he made sure I knew. And I'm sure that I took, you know, if I had been evasive or obstinate, he would have called my parents and it would have meant lock her up. She's doing something wrong. Mm -hmm. And I really wasn't, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Yeah. And what's it like to learn to lie and deceive? Cause you're still believing, but you're learning how to game a system while still believing. So in a sense, this system that holds itself up as the pinnacle and the source of all truth and righteousness is kind of teaching you to lie. What's that like? Yeah. Well, you don't realize that you're gaming. I mean, you, you're, you are definitely gaming the system, but to be, I think for me to belong to such a high demand faith, you start by lying to yourself very, very early. So lying to others, it doesn't feel like deceit. Mm. You're just perpetuating the same things you're telling yourself mm -hmm. every day. Like this isn't coffee. This is a latte, <laughs> you know, or this is the Costco mocha freeze. This isn't coffee. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the lies that we tell ourselves so that we can live with ourselves because mm -hmm. the demands are, are, I don't want to say so rigorous, but they're so far reaching, you know, and sometimes they're really contrary to who we authentically are. So in order, you just continually lie to yourself. So when you're, you know, I didn't think about being sinful. I just wanted to lie to myself that I would never read Twin Peaks, Bishop. That's disgusting, you know? Yeah. So lying to him was just a perpetuation of the delusion that you're already under, you know? Yeah. But you, so you learn to deceive yourself first of all. And that's why, you know, you don't even know that the Holy Ghost is just you. You tell yourself every bad thought is from the devil and every you know, good thought is from God and that you have no role in it. Mm. Totally. <laughs> Can I just mind? say, and it's so, I, I think a key part that you bring out so well is this idea of the system, the, the church kind of creates it. They create when, when love belonging 
salvation, your family's salvation, when, the, when these things are on the line, and we're talking about thoughts, actions, and just being human, the fact that we learn as we, like this is just being human, we learn as we go, we experience, mistakes are part of breathing, being alive, but then they tie things like love, belonging, safety, your, you being with your family, Forever. When that's the cost, like yeah. yeah, yeah, you're going to lie. It creates this dichotomy of like, yeah, I'm going to do what I have to do out here to get my needs met because mm -hmm. that's what we all do. Yeah. And then those other parts of us kind of get, we, we kind of cram them down. They're just for us. Or we, we hide let them. them die all together. That's right. You know, in the darkness, I yeah. think when you let them die all together, it's, it's a peaceful, better way to live. And I lied to myself and told myself that that was the refiner's fire that was purging myself of all infirmities and sins and bad thoughts. And that was purity, mm -hmm. but that's, it, there's no way that purity can be the death of self. It's exactly. the opposite, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. So speaking of getting your needs met, <laughs> we're going to talk about Robert Barnes. Is that his name? Oh. Oh, no, James Barnes. Oh, James Barnes. James, James Barnes. That's We're going to talk about James Barnes, loud. speaking of getting your needs met. So turn to that Fake section. name. Fake name? To protect him, but it was an even funnier name, but... Okay, so Margie, you... Oh. This is the first scene Margie read to me. She read it to me in the kitchen. <laughs> and um, this is a great... This is... Is this the best? I mean, this, this writing. One of the best scenes. Do you want to talk about why you loved it? While I don't she's know. It'd be it hard to pick a best scene, <laughs> but what I would just say is the writing, <laughs> the writing of this scene. And this is the thing. I'll just give a little plug for the book because we're going to give Heather a minute. But it's just like I did find myself feeling all the things in in this book. You have this sense of loss, loss of parts of Heather, loss of relationships. Um, you know, a loss of the way things might have been, then you laugh, you laugh out loud and you just feel all the things yeah. with the book. And I laughed out loud yeah. with this section. That makes me so happy because of course humor is my love language yeah. and, and music, but there is so much like sadness in this unlived life, you know? And that was part of like the grief. I think I felt the most writing the book is these sliding door mm -hmm. moments where you just absolutely denied who you were and what you wanted for something, a greater promise. Mm -hmm. And then when that greater promise isn't fulfilled, there's just, it's really easy to turn to bitterness and resentment and sadness, mm -hmm. but that won't work either. So we just forge ahead and we attribute it to weakness, laziness, sinful nature, you know, mm -hmm. man, but it really is our magic. It's the magic. It is your magic. And guess what? Every time I go back to this restaurant, I remember and I see that tree and I see it with such different perspective now. And I regret, I have deep, deep regret for all the times that I had duty to the Mormon church instead of duty to that part of my soul that, you know, my end to self. Yeah. We have news for you. Guess, guess where Margie and I were engaged. In the tree room. At the tree room. Margie, ah. this is our book. <laughs> Margie, you're going to oust Dre. What's going to happen? <laughs> That's impossible. Okay. I'm never so, doing that. Do you really want me to... Give us whatever background you... This has to be captured on film. Okay, 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 okay. So, so this is going to be... You said it's James Barnes? Is that the name? It's James Barnes the third, but I didn't put that part in either. Um, okay. And it, yeah, um, it takes place at the what page the, are we on? The tree room, which oh, is at Sundance. At the tanning salon. So Robert, it's, for I those know, who have never I'm, been Mormon, while Heather's looking this up, I'm uh, stalling. Uh, Robert Rise Redford, the famous actor, came to Utah, bought a bunch of land up the canyon, Provo Canyon, and created a ski resort called Sundance after his role in uh, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. And he created this super cool restaurant uh, called the Tree Room, which has a huge tree right in the middle of the restaurant that's uh, going through it. So, Heather, you were working where? I was working at Electric Beach Tanning Salon as on 9th a, and 9th. I love the word you used. As a what? As the tanning engineer. A tanning engineer. I've <laughs> never heard that term. Promoted to manager. <laughs> okay. Take um, it away, Heather. And this is, uh, <laughs> I'm trying to see a good part to start. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, 
Despite the cold, dark winter of the Honor Code's domain, when I returned to Provo and my job at Electric Beach, I was happy to provide patrons the sights, sounds, and sun of summer all year round. Rich or poor, Honor Code abiding or defying, we made the UV rays shine down on all of them. Our beds did not distinguish between saint and sinner. Electric Beach was a safe space for everyone, even older men with sugar daddy potential. When James Bond sauntered up to our counter, he seemed out of place for the average college student customer. I asked if he had any questions and geared up to pitch him on buying a bottle of lotion. I got 7% of the store's gross lotion sales, and the only customers who ever splurged on them were the ones not paying tuition. He was an easy mark. I had him fill out the customer card and began to enter his data into the computer. Name, James Barnes. Address, Idaho. Hmm, not local, but not far. Birth date, October 5th, 1963. 1963? He was 33 years old. Definitely had discretionary income for our finest bronzing lotion. I started with a quick speech about the damage caused by the sun's rays and the danger of a tan that fades too quickly and glided right into the different pricing tiers of lotion that would prevent all of these woes. I'm going to skip ahead. I sell him on taking me out. Cause don't you think we should get to the tree room part? Yes. Oh, yeah. So he takes, um, so he, you guys, he asks you out. So he asks me out and I go and I have him meet me at the tanning salon cause I was smart and safe. <laughs> Didn't want an older non possibly non Mormon man. I was pretty sure he was non Mormon because he was 33. He liked me and he, uh, he liked me and he was 33 yeah. and you know, single <laughs> and single. Oh, that's, that's what I meant. Yeah. yeah. Single, not married that I knew of 33 and into me. So every sign pointed to non-Mormon. And, and it's worth mentioning that I think you mentioned in our interview that you, you were a little big for the guys at BYU. And I mean, big in a personality way and in, an accomplishment in all ways, way. John, in no, all no, no, ways. No, no, no. I meant, I meant personality wise. <laughs> I know. You know what? I actually read an article um, the other day that really, changed my whole perspective on that. And I remember the first time I was here, we tried to explain to you what FP was, fat potential, you right, know? Yeah. And I I knew that physically I was bigger than the cute, you know, petite blondes that were getting married up by the dozen. But Julia Louis-Dreyfus said that her dad told her she was too big, too broad. And if you've ever met her, and I did get to meet her at Sundance, she is like five foot nothing and petite as a, a bird. Yeah. And what she meant was her magnetism, her personality, her effect on the world was too big, too broad. And seeing someone be described that way, that's so petite, helped me realize that I absolutely was too big, too broad for BYU. You know, it didn't work for my faith, for everything. So this guy's showing interest in you. Yeah. He asked me out. He's, he's, you know, seems to, he's got a silver Mercedes. He wants to take me out to dinner. With his name and embroidered on the his, dashboard. Yes, he had he had some weird flexes that you'll read about in the book, but uh, the date was uh, pretty good. So, um, so you're in the tree room. We're in the tree room. And uh, let's see, let's get to where he, okay. While the server left, wait, the waiter asked him if he would like a nightcap and he casually asked if they had any drambui. While the server left to get his drink, he used the opportunity to take my hand in his. He interlaced our fingers and traced my palm with his thumb. When his drink arrived, he raised the snifter up and tilted it to catch the light. Do you see the flecks of gold? Yes, dear God. Yes, I see it all. Take me now. <laughs> Drambui is a golden scotch whiskey liqueur. He swirled it in the glass and held it up to my nose. Smell this. I closed my eyes and inhaled deeply, too deeply, because I heard him chuckle. My eyes snapped open. It's incredible, right? I nodded lamely. Drambui comes directly from the hills of Scotland and is infused with honey, spices, and one very special ingredient. He took a sip and handed me the glass. Drink some and then lick your lips. So dumb. I just. Mm. What are you feeling? I mean, I can taste that drambuie, and I can remember licking my lips and like him describing this to me and thinking, my mind is opened and I can see, you know, and just having this moment of adulthood, of adult womanhood, of being a girl on a date with a man, and having it all be make-believe, you know? 
I held the glass to my lips and swallowed. It burned, but it wasn't bitter. I licked my lips and could taste the hills of Scotland. I could feel the passion of William Wallace. I could hear the groan of the Loch Ness monster from the deep. He leaned in across the table. Did you taste it? Uh Uh-huh. Um, yeah, I think so. Take me. I believe it doesn't matter what you ask me to do. I'm going to do it. Drambuy me all (laughs) night long. He dipped my finger in the glass and put it in his mouth, pulling me closer. I was about to climb across the table or climb the trunk of the giant namesake tree in front of me. He took my finger out of his mouth and held onto my hand. The secret ingredient is Heather. He put his other hand under my chin and pulled my lips to his. He kissed me softly and slowly at first, and I could taste the drambuie and the honey and the hills of heather on his tongue. They harvest the natural heather and then infuse it into the whiskey. It's subtle, strong, and rare, just like you. Check, please. Oh, that's, that. I'll leave it at that. You have to read, you have to buy the book to hear what happens. It's so good. So, good. <laughs> so, so, and I, I love that that actually, you know, cause this is one of the most comic comedic parts of the book <laughs> and yet you're feeling a whole different set of emotions right now. Well, that's probably how I process most of my pain through humor, mm-hmm. but it was funny too. You yeah. know, life is usual, usually Dre and I always say it's beautiful, sad, funny, and true. And those are the moments that are most poignant. And that's why I think this story is beautiful, you know, describing the experience, but it's also funny and there's some sadness and it's true because it's exactly what happened. And it was a moment that, um, you know, I probably most girls have 10,000 of, but it was my only moment ever. Oh, Oh, I feel that so much. Only moment ever. Like only what? real moment on a real date with a real man that really was interested in knowing who I really was mm. and knew that maybe the secret ingredient was Heather, mm. you know? You haven't had that since? Like even after the divorce and everything? No. Mm. I think that part, that magic is far behind me now. Yeah. I, th- I love the symbolism in it because I did feel like reading it you were fully present for a moment in that date, Um, just experiencing that it felt like the conditioning left for a minute and you were able to just be yourself experiencing sexual sexual attraction, um, joy, pleasure of a moment without all that stuff. And so it literally was like Heather was there in that. And then before long, the conditioning comes back. Yeah. You're and you're back on the it's like the backdrop drops back to my reality. Yeah. You know, the next morning. Yeah. And you walk away. I, I was wondering in the book if you've contacted him since if you know. No, will he, he be is. ninety? So oh. no, I have not. No, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> you know, for all I know, he was a cad from Boise with four children and a wife. You know, I don't know. Yeah. It didn't matter because it was just a moment yeah. for me to be. It was a, like a, my womanhood. Like it, yeah. it, my womanhood wasn't turning 18 and getting a, you know, young women's medallion and having my personal progress book signed by 15 leaders. My moment oh. of feeling feminine and a sexual being and a, an attractive being and a whole person was probably on that date. Yeah. 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 And it happened in minutes. And in minutes. Gone. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you, you serve a mission. I, I love to learn that you were like a concert level pianist at high school. <laughs> yes. I didn't know that. Um, I gave it up. U- University of Utah is a party school. I'm not no, going to take a scholarship to a yeah. party school, John. What kind of Mormon do you think I am? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but you all, I mean, there's your entrepreneurial stuff at BYU, which was super cool doing jewelry for down, you know, down East, was it? Yeah, and, Down East Outfitters and Nordstrom. The earrings. Yeah. And but, Sundance. Right. So we'll fast forward though, because we can't cover it all. Um, so you meet, um, you meet your ex-husband, Billy Gay, who really is Mormon elite, Mormon royalty. His grandpa had known Howard Hughes. Mm -hmm. He kind of run the Mormon mafia. You know, he was a famous, well-known, well-connected Mormon. Yeah. And the gays, like I worked for Bain and company, you know, 
And so Billy's brother would have been a really important part of banning. Yeah, Billy's uncle, Bob, right. was partners oh, with uncle. Mitt Romney okay. for like okay. 25 years, and they were the founding people, yeah, I think, at Bain. Yeah, bunch of venture capital stuff is happening in, in the gay name. Anyway, gay name is a big deal. There's a general authority, right? Yeah, well, it's Bob Gay. He was the Mitt Romney's okay. partner. He's okay. he's retired now. Yeah. General so, Emeritus or whatever mm-hmm. it's called. So there's, a, you know, the great parts, and you, we talked about this in our interview, where you meet Billy and, and you, you realize you're marrying into kind of wealthy Mormon royalty um, and uh, Huntington Beach and all that. But but you marry him, and it just seems like, I mean, there's so much we could talk about that, that marriage. Margie and I probably talked the most about your marriage to Billy. And I, I was struck by how hard you were trying to be the perfect Mormon wife. You had failed at being the perfect Mormon child. You failed at being the Mormon teen. You failed at being, I, you were a great missionary. I don't know that but you I were failed. a bad missionary. I failed because it's the, it's the one mark, you know, it's the one. You, You're the most I successful missionary in your mission. But, but success but in not France, to God. It was it was hundred percent obedience. Perfection. You've Cause, ruined cause it. You, you know, you stole your... fizzy lifting dust the glass. You know, you it's saw like... a Titanic on your mission. Is that why? Or... You can't I can't. That's a tease, John. Oh, sorry, that's sorry, a sorry. tease. Okay. okay. <laughs> I just ruined it. We the can't book. we can't give it all <laughs> away, John. I'm sorry, we can't give I'm it all sorry. away. There's so many nuggets in this book, but yeah. I f- I was bad at all of it for different reasons. Because you can never be good enough in but Mormonism, you, right? But you can't be a bad wife, when you have kids, you've got to make it work. So, and the only plan to make it work is what? 100% obedience. Yeah. And if you are 100% obedient, the windows of heaven will be opened upon you so much that the you will not be able to receive the blessings, right? Yeah. And that's the only, that's the one promise that we're given in the temple. That's the one spiritual part of the temple. That's the one promise that outweighs all of the discipline and all of the, you know, sacrifice is that you are sealed not only to God, but to this man and to your children. So if you're ever going to dig deep and let all of those parts of you die that are taking you away from the new and everlasting covenant, it is now because now it's, you know, it's done. I've made those oaths. I've kneeled across that altar. My fate is sealed. I'm still sealed to Billy. You mean now? Yeah. Yeah, right. And your kids to you and Billy. Yeah. So what I was going to ask, two of the scenes from your marriage that were really, Margie and I talked a ton about, one was the Southwest Airlines stock scene, (laughs) and the other was the baptism, preparing the baptism for your daughter scene. Mm -hmm. But what, without necessarily needing to really dig into those, I wanted to know what's the pressure like to live in Salt Lake City to marry a wealthy, connected, general authority connected, apostle connected, wealthy Mormon family, and then to try and be a a perfect Mormon mom in the shadow of the temple, in the shadow of this wealthy, connected Mormon family, and to try and be a mom in that, in that shadow. Well, it's, and a, I mean, a wife, a it's wife a little a mis, it's a little bit misleading because I too was Mormon royalty. Right. I felt like I was really the catch because <laughs> he was, he had the reason that he was royalty because it was because of his grandfather, but it was really his mother. I mean, it was really his mother that was the most devout of their whole family. And I was kind of the, um, I was the real Mormon pioneer. You know, I had I didn't have any aberrations of like ever everyone in my family was active, you know. Everyone was temple going. Like I felt like I was the prize. So but it felt he, like a lateral move to you. It felt like a it <laughs> felt like an arranged marriage because he was the first Mormon guy that liked me. That was over that was over six feet tall. So I didn't feel hulking and who um had money. And a family and a career. So it's like, I felt like, oh, I had given up hope of the package deal, but here it is. And I'd be a fool to walk away from it. So it wasn't, I didn't ever feel in the shadow of his wealth or connections because mm. I was, you know, mm. the captain. Mm-hmm. I knew the scriptures forward and backward. He had come home early from his mission. He had, you know, a sister and brother who weren't active. His dad, they hadn't gotten sailed in the temple till he was 15. Mm. You know, they weren't, they had been a little bit, you know, wayward. Oh. So he had this name and this money. Yeah. 
but, uh, and those were the religiosity. I had the religiosity and I had the street cred in terms of the faith. So I felt like it was a perfect match, you know, equal, equal oxen yoked together. But the pressure, the thing that I didn't ever realize is that's how I felt going into the marriage. But the way the world saw it was I only became visible and I was only had like cultural currency, not because of the fact that I was like my mom and a great mom and creative and contributor and hard worker, but because I was married to someone of wealth and stature in the Mormon church, I, that visibility was so obvious to me. It was like, I walked through a door and all of a sudden I'd be at a thing and they'd say, Oh, you're married to Billy Gay. His grandpa was Mormon mafia. And then the heads would turn and I felt it. It was tangible. Wow. The credibility was tangible. And that is probably why it made it so devastating for me when he rejected me and divorced me because I had felt the difference, even though I was the same contributor, I was Relief Society president. I was, you know, missionary successful. I was all these things, but none of that ever carried the weight of marrying him. Mm. And P.S., none of that mattered until I was married anyway. Yeah, which is just really um, an additional power differential in a relationship, Absolutely. Right? It only adds to that. Mm -hmm. So what, if you had to describe what, how Mormonism failed you and Billy, because you get the sense that you knew in the honeymoon that it probably wasn't the right fit, Describe for our audience maybe how Mormonism and its and its plan and its model for marriage maybe failed you and Billy. You know, it's so funny because I still think, well, I f it failed me because I didn't fit. You know, I don't. I still see it as the great edifice. You know, and I didn't fit in. Like I couldn't f get small enough to get through the door or big enough to climb out. But the way that the program failed both of us was that we were both trying to supplant the personality of a good member of the church of Jesus Christ over who we really were, mm, which yeah. meant that parts of me would have to die in order to be a stay at home mom that was dedicated to my husband and children and to nurture, you know, everything that the family proclamation states. What that, parts of you had to die? I mean, what parts of me had to die? Everything. <laughs> I mean, self divination first and foremost, that's a pretty big part of your identity. Uh, my authority in the home, in life, my ambition, my goals, my dreams, where I wanted to live, what I wanted to name my kids, what I want, you know, I mean, it's all compromised, but when you're in a arranged marriage of sorts, it, none of it's compromised. It's all a little, yeah. little, a thousand little deaths, you know, death by a thousand little cuts, paper cuts, I guess you'd say. Yeah. But, um, do you have a sense for how Billy had to die? Yeah, Billy absolutely had to die. He had left the corporate business. He wanted to be a filmmaker. He wanted to be an entrepreneur. And he also, his personality didn't really lend himself to being a, I'll take care of everything guy. And I thought just, and, but he probably assumed that a good Mormon mom would be an I'll take care of everything mom, you know, which that's what we do. And I wanted the provider, presider to make me feel safe and I didn't want to have to make decisions anymore. I didn't want to have to make money. I wanted to just f sit on a pillow and have babies and decorate and raise them because that's what, if I stayed within that box, then I would never want or need for anything. And that was a, somewhere that's green, a little patch of land with a little fence, a dog and a baby and a husband that worships me. But he wanted to do, not do any of those things. So what I wanted from him, he was rush, running away from, and what he wanted from me, I didn't have in it to be. Yeah. And that's how we both deluded ourselves. We lied to ourselves saying, with the gospel, with a family, the things that are pulling us away from this will die. Refiner's fire, purify your heart, you know. Suffer. Per, per, yes, suffer until martyrdom. Yeah, self-betray. Yeah, duty to God over duty to self, which is really betray yourself mm -hmm. to follow the program and to avoid the shame and fear of all the horrible things. I mean, I think our marriage would have failed if we, if sooner if I hadn't been able to get pregnant. The children kept us, you know, me absolutely kept me 100% committed. Um, it would have failed if we had had sex before we got married. Because once we scratched that itch, we were like, 
We gave up a lot to scratch that itch. Mm, really? That's such we an We blinded point. ourselves to scratch this itch and have sex. And it was worth it in that moment. But I didn't realize that sex gets old pretty fast when there's nothing else there, you know? When you've been deprived sealed. for so long and you're sealed for, you know? For eternity, you're sealed. Yeah, I mean, everyone understands like the anticipation and then, you know, you have, and I don't want to just say that's why it failed because that's, but that was just why we got married for sure yeah. amongst all the other things. But the church, number one, doesn't let either of you really know, get, get to know who you are, heal from your traumas, and then spend enough time together to know that you really want to spend a lifetime together. It's just like, oh, you're both righteous enough, get married, start having kids, figure out your career, and you'll be happy. And your, your book makes it really clear. I mean, I agree with that, but I also th want to add, and I hope the book reveals this, is that the church also teaches you to not reveal yes, everything you are. That's mm. so big. And so you don't, you would never sit down. And I don't think a guy would ever sit down with a prospective virgin bride and say, listen, I struggled with pornography for about 10 years, mm -hmm. but I want you to know it's going to be a struggle throughout our marriage. But if you stick with me and you know, you know, we don't reveal, I don't ever say, you know, I almost ran off to Scotland with a glass of Drambuie and a backpack. You know, I, we all, we both present who we want to be and who we want to be are pure vessels of the Lord. We show our personality. We say what foods we like. We, we know the, the latitude, the parameters that we can play with. There are certain variables that you can express your identity with and feel zero fear. Like, oh, I hate, you know, sports action films, or I hate football. Like we feel comfortable saying things that stay within the confines of our sandbox of what a Mormon girl is supposed to be. And he does too. So he would never tell you before you married him that he likes to put on women's panties. Mm -hmm. That's, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. But a guy now would, mm -hmm. and that's what I think it is. Like we just don't reveal to ourselves who we really are. He, Billy did not want to wear, I mean, not that that's a bad thing, but he didn't. I just want to make sure that I make that just decision. Yes. I'm just trying to find some shocking <laughs> yeah. innocuous thing. Yeah, right. We don't reveal that to ourselves, let alone to our prospective spouses. And that is part of the conditioning. And I think for many of us, that conditioning is also present in our families. So then you have layers, like your family works that way, where you know you don't reveal because you get punished, or and then you have the, the kind of church layering. So all you're experiencing are the select like sunshine things that get mm -hmm. us approval. That's what we're having a relationship with. Yeah. All that other stuff we buried, remember? Like, no one's getting to that. We lead with, oh, I'm addicted to Diet Coke, and I'm always 10 minutes late. <laughs> That's and right. I'm such my a kids are, I'm, My kids are such a mess. I'm and, an overachiever. Oh, we're microwaving dinner tonight, kids. <laughs> I mean, we, we think we're so self-deprecating, have all these layers. We don't say, yeah. you know, I'm crying in the fetal position in the shower, because normally we're not. Yeah. Because we never even get that raw or real with ourselves unless yeah. something pushes us over the edge. Divorce, yeah. a child and a, a child that's errant, you know, yeah. finding out about addiction, suffering from addiction, a car accident. I mean, there, it's big life things that force us through that facade that we've created. It's a glass castle that we build to live in. And it, as long as it never shatters, you can get from A to Z, you know? It's so true. But when does it not shatter, you know? I think it's shattering more and more now because of the yeah. social progress that we're making and because the visibility, like my brother was 50 years old before he Googled anything about Joseph Smith. Mm -hmm. And he's an attorney that works in compliance in yeah. Switzerland. He's bilingual. He's a genius. Mm -hmm. He's a smart, educated, funny guy that watches independent film and speaks three languages, you know? Yeah. And memorizes baseball stats. And he didn't ever know anything about Joseph Smith that was negative. Mm. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of really smart men and women out there that are the exact same way. And you know what they would say to me? I don't want to know. Yeah. Don't tell me. Mm -hmm. I also wonder now if more and more it's, it's the children that are bringing it to the parents, either by not wanting oh, to yeah. go or yeah. social issues that they identify as LGBTQIA. So that I wonder sometimes now if... Just statistically speaking, the kids now are leaving at alarming rates. So it's and it's and it's this total cognitive dissonance for parents who have sacrificed everything to keep their family together and keep it eternal. And now by clinging to those tenets, they're losing their children. Yeah. And so it becomes this dilemma of yeah. 
do I believe in the gospel fixing everything in the celestial kingdom and me going down the elevator to visit my children yeah, right. and say, get married to a man, be this, and then you can come join us at our table. And, you know. So I was happy to see, and I think you, I'm sure you did this intentionally, of all the bads, you know, in, in the book, bad, bad daughter, bad missionary, bad wife, there's never a bad mother. I know you love your daughters and I'm, I'm happy to see that you're probably somewhat proud, if not extremely proud of how you've been as a mom, but have I, what I really, um, I just want to throw that out there. You know, the reason that there really isn't a bad mother is because, um, I don't think there is such a thing as a bad or a good mother. I think a mother is just a, a, physical thing where you give birth to a child, you know, and it's, that is bad or good is every woman's choice to divinate. And it's not the society's gaze that's between that child and that woman. And because I'd been identified by all these things, you know, I just thought I'm not going to critique my motherhood because I'm still in it. Yeah. And I'm finally becoming the mother that I want to be to my children and bad mother, if anything, would come after badass because the world would see me now as a bad mother because I'm telling, saying to my kids, be who you want to be, explore what you want to explore. Tell me everything. Ask me everything. Don't tell me any details. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'm doing all the things. Wear a crop top, yeah. you know, wear. Explore. Explore. Jamie. Date. Jamie's okay. I want my yeah. daughter in college to have lots of experiences healthy, wonderful, sex affirming, sex positive experiences. I want her to be drambuied all night long <laughs> by anyone that she even feels a spark with. And through that process, discover who she is and how she relates to men or women and what kind of person and life and marriage she wants to have. Mm -hmm. So yeah. by the church's standards, I would be a bad mother now after I became a badass. <laughs> That's powerful. But I just want to pipe in really quick and say that when we were talking at the beginning of the interview about your mom, I see so much of your mom in you. And I don't think that anybody really would ever think that you're a bad mother. You're a wonderful mother, just like your mom's. You make everything magical for your mm -hmm. kids and you give them every tiny ounce of yourself and yeah. they feel that. And I see it. Yeah. Yeah. Bad mother would never apply, Heather, ever. <laughs> I was such a bad mother. I was gone for four days in Toronto doing that press tour. And I was like parenting through my phone and had Alexis took him Cafe Rio. And I just felt like Great. They're once you leave the church, you fall off the cliff. Your kids are raised on TV dinners. Look what, look what happened. No, Heather, you love your kids. You're a wonderful mother. And you're right. Mother is just a thing that we are, right? Yeah. Like yeah. whether we birth them ourselves or we adopt them or whatever, however we come to be in this role of mother, it's all it is. It's yeah. Just, it's our role. Yeah. And you can be a killer businesswoman and a bad mother and a good person. You can be a bad mom and a good person. You know, yeah. we've, we've not forgiven women that latitude. Yeah. But what? bad dads, yeah. nobody gives a shit if you're a bad dad. Mm. You'll still be president of the United States. You know what I mean? Not that, I don't know if there's bad dads that are presidents, but I'd assume. Yeah. <laughs> One thing I love that and I find is true about parenting and I'm seeing just really in you is sometimes we'll go through and have a wound. Like I see a loss for you that you navigate in the book about, um, you know, this sense of connection to yourself. And, you know, sometimes we don't we don't get to get that back. You know, that's we have to kind of salute it from ashore and let the ship sail of, you know, what we didn't get or what we didn't have or didn't experience. But I have to say, like, it is, it can be healing. And I'm curious if this is it for you. And I see this in you. Is that thing that you didn't have, you are now providing your daughters. You are providing them now something you didn't get, right? And that's Absolutely. connection to themselves. Room to explore and get to know themselves and develop trust in themselves to navigate all the things that are kind of asked of us to be alive, you know, yeah. and sometimes that's all we have. That's it's, the it best feels we've got. very healing to watch. I mean, I have a daughter just a sophomore in college and to have her make 
all these choices and this autonomy and this self-awareness, you know, and some of it is, is ridiculous and fun because she's 19, but a lot of it is absolutely blossoming Mm -hmm. into the woman she is. And she said to me, you know, the world is so big and like just those words to me, she's, she's in Santa Barbara on Isla Vista, you know, it's like this big, (laughs) but just leaving this and and seeing herself in a totally different context, she's absolutely becoming her own person. And it's an honor to even be a part of her life, you know? Yeah. Let's jump to what a summary of what caused you to lose your faith. When you came on Mormon stories, I don't think you were fully processed in your testimony. I think you were still very conflicted. If you had to spend five minutes talking about your faith journey out of Mormonism, take take people through kind of how you deconstructed and what sources or what things you learned that really were the shelf items that, that broke it for you. Well, coming on Mormon stories, I did as a, as a a gift to my dear best friend (laughs) because their love is true (laughs) because love is so true but I um Mormon stories and people that leave the church and I'm I don't want to say anti-Mormons I'm going to say bad Mormons had been demonized in my mind as qualities that I did not want that I think I was afraid to be associated with. So despite my cognitive dissonance, despite my shelf, I didn't feel like I even had a shelf being broken because for me, it was really like, I never put anything on the shelf because that's just where I lived. You know what I mean? Like I didn't, Mm -hmm. it was based on, this is my identity. Every choice in my life had been informed by Mormonism. So I didn't know how to walk away without becoming an ex-Mormon or a Mormon stories listener, which had been demonized to angry, bitter, uh, offended, overly sensitive, um, immature thinkers, and just disgruntled, you know, like the parents of the world that are banging, asking for their rebate. You know, I just, Mm. that is what I feared. And then, and then even though I knew people that loved it, I, I just thought, I don't want to paint myself with that brush ever. I I never had any intention of vocally, openly speaking against the church. And that's what I think I was still like, my tongue was loosed after coming on, on here and realizing at that tipping point with the outpouring of support from the Mormon stories community. I mean, we could say that it was, that was 100% what caused my shelf to break in a beautiful way that like, or gave, gave me a community and an identity and a safe place to, to give my story and my experience any validity because everything I've done has no value in my immediate family and my, maybe my extended family, but in my community, it just doesn't, you know, I went to a Christmas Eve party and they asked me how I'm keeping busy. And, you know, they all know that I'm on like three TV shows <laughs> right now, writing a book, you know, opening a second location to a million dollar business that I started from scratch as a side gig. Mm-hmm. Like I am so proud of so much. They know I have a daughter in college. How are you keeping busy? And what are you going to do when Annabelle graduates? <laughs> and that is what my life was, you know, still defined by, by, wow. the, by, the Orthodox by being a mother yeah. and a and a daughter and they're not asking me what my calling is, which would have been the next question if they knew I was still active. So it's just the elephant in the room, but I forgot the question now. So your, your shelf started to break. It broke when I had this outpouring of love and support and I, I didn't have the courage to not believe yet. I didn't, it was like, I'm swinging on a vine. I wanted to cling to it because it was all I knew. And it was, it would be like saying, you know, if you were Greek, it's like, well, you're not living the the Orthodox rules, so you can't be Greek anymore. You can't eat our food. You can't come to our parties. You can't sing our songs. You can't do our dances. And you can't tell anyone you're Greek because we're going to openly attack and reject you. And when I came on Mormon Stories, I was being openly attacked by all the Mormons. 
they were discrediting my experiences, discrediting my story, discrediting anything I said about the church. They were fact checking my opinion. And that was quite problematic. So after I came on Mormon Stories, the audience just really reached out, showed support, validated that I wasn't the crazy sinner that had gone, you know, haywire. I was in a community of other brilliant, smart, accomplished, like-minded people that were also grieving the sacrifices that they had made for an institution that the second they didn't adhere to it, rejected them and not only rejected them, but punished them and shamed them. And so it was really having that life raft, that community that gave me the strength to respect my story and respect my experience and now share it with people. And that was when I said, I don't want my name on the records of this church, you know, and Mm -hmm. started the paperwork to be done something I clung to because I didn't want to hurt my parents' feelings. But guess what? My dad's passed and my mom didn't speak to me on Christmas Eve. Mm. So I don't want to be associated with an institution that is this destructive to families and to women who are trying to make something of their way in the world. Yeah. Because I, I think that it's both, you know? Yeah. Nobody likes an uppity uppity relief society president <laughs> uppity ex really you know it's just did you have to deconstruct joseph smith and the book of mormon and the theology and if so how did you do that i haven't yet oh okay i'm in the process of doing that dre and i are writing a mini series about the joseph smith story from the perspective of emma we started a production company and Ooh. it's going to be wow. it is going to be Really, Dre's Dre's catharsis of all of it, too, I think, you know, because you've been distanced from it for so long in such a way. But there's so much to disentangle from her experiences that she's had the last 20 years, you know. And for me, um, I had to get there, too. And so I think that process is going to help me really, as a writer and as a producer, deconstruct Joseph Smith and the Book of Mormon. You know, you hear me start to do it in the book. And I did that based on things that I'd heard from Dre and from Casey and from you and from Margie, you know, just from, this is my anti-Mormon community, you know, (laughs) but the the wonderful people that DM me and email me and, and, you know, resonate with the story. Like now I want to get to the historical integrity because I started taking catechism classes for at the Greek Orthodox church down the street. And they talked about historical integrity of the scriptures first written in Greek and written by four or five witnesses. And he just said, you know, the scriptures didn't just fall out of the sky. We have historical integrity. And I just, something clicked in my brain and I thought, but they did fall out of the sky. They fell right out of the sky and they were buried in a mountain and we're going to return to Jackson place. County, Missouri. And <laughs> how can this be so absurd to you? But hearing the parallels that like Joseph Smith really did pirate just biblical Christianity and add some thrills around it for him and, you know, the girls in the barn. And that is where the process started. But that was just, you know, weeks ago. Mm. So I think the deconstructing of my testimony, the the intellectual departure is going to happen through our through the art that we're creating mm. and the stories we're going to be telling that way. I love it. Yeah. You'll bring us back on for Mormon Stories mm-hmm. to tout yeah, our mini series, right? Anytime, absolutely. We'll that's, book it now. We'll probably be in news. demand. Yeah. <laughs> so um this may be the interview where you talk about real housewives the least, but the but like I was finishing your book this morning. I had such a lightning bolt moment. And let me try and explain it to you. I, I mentioned to you before that, like, of course, you know, there's a stigma to real housewives. There's probably some trope that in some ways it's like the least real thing, that it's reality TV, that it's scripted or whatever, that it's maybe some would say vapid or superficial or whatever. I, I loved how you ended your book uh, talking about what the real – housewives community slash fan base slash your friends have meant to you. But what was so powerful is you contrasted that with your Mormon life before. And so I guess I want to end this part and then we'll talk really quickly. We'll have, um, we'll talk a little bit about some legal intrigue. Um, but I, I wanted to end this part asking you to, to muse about what real means to you now real 
in ways where the church kind of failed you, realness in ways that the church failed you, but realness in terms of what you've discovered. You know, the Mormonism will teach you that wickedness never was happiness. A Mormon would look at real housewives and say, that's pure that wickedness. is pure wickedness. Mm -hmm. But like, what have you learned about what real means and what has real housewives given you in that context? Well, I think that in the book, you really get the context that I was living a performative reality for so long and a performative reality in terms of this is how I want my life to be as a Mormon. So I'm going to pretend it's this way. And I'm going to pretend that my husband loves me and dotes on me. And I'm going to pretend that I love him and dote on him. And that was more performative reality than I've ever had to do on television. So it was this magical transformation of the reality television forcing me to be authentic and real. And then once I got on TV, I knew that nothing, you know, the cameras can't really tell a lie. You know, they reveal everything. And it was the community that emerged. And it wasn't just Housewives fans, although they were huge. I mean, the visibility of Housewives was so far reaching, but it was really the people that identified across all faiths, all ethnicities, all regions of the world saying, you know, I was a devout Catholic. I forewent the loves of my life because they had a op opposite faiths. You know, I, I sacrificed and worked in this convent for 40 years and it's a life unlived and I resonate with you. And it was people from all over saying, I feel seen, I feel represented and thank you. And that community is how is the community that I want to clap my hands with joy to be a part of the others you know, we're doing this documentary on the uh, Bad Mormon behind the scenes tour, Dre and I, and we are calling it No Empty Chairs because we were so, we were just terrified by this concept of empty chairs mm -hmm. at the, around the table with God if we didn't follow all the rules to be with our family. And our parents would say to us, we don't want any empty chairs, so read your scriptures, don't drink, don't smoke, don't, you know, do it all, or there's going to be an empty chair at our table. But guess what that implies? That everyone else is there and you're the one missing. But no empty chairs for the ex-Mormons, for the bad Mormons, for the bad Catholics, for the bad, anyone that has felt like they belong to a group that they weren't accepted in and their authentic self caused pain to the people they loved most. Those are the community now that we say, you know, <laughs> this is who, this is the community that we are filling the venues for this. Uh, how do I say it? Book tour? No. Well, yeah, for the book tour, we're selling out. There are literally no empty chairs because every seat is filled by this community of others, by this community of people that have been rejected by their faith, rejected by their families, rejected by their communities, and have been, never been given visibility. But housewives, reality TV, trash TV, whatever it is, is far reaching and it's visible and I'm on it. And so by me talking and representing for all of the others, it's literally no empty chairs because we're selling, selling out every venue and we are making sure that everyone's included. And that's kind of the full circle moment for me. And what about your, so you obviously struggled to find joy and happiness in all the stages that you talk about where you failed in your childhood, failed in your mission, failed as a wife. Um, and there's even a part in the book where you're starting to get in reality TV where someone asks you if you're happy or whatever. And don't you say something like a zero? At the a zero, time? one. Yeah, I'm still not happy, yeah. John. Happiness is an elusive concept. So but are you, but is, <laughs> no, so I'm happy. now that you are kind of breaking free and finding your authentic, real self, yeah. are you starting to find some of that happiness or Abs joy? Absolutely. So describe how wickedness can be happiness for you. Well, wickedness has been absolute happiness for me. And True happiness is honoring your authentic self. I feel like I'm honoring that 10 year old girl that woke up one morning and realized who she was, was not going to work. And she'd have to change in order to be liked, in order to be loved, in order to be accepted and in order to belong, you know, and I did, I died all those deaths, but I was never really accepted because I never accepted myself. I kept trying to, you know, cut off the rough edges, but by now I'm happy because I 
can own my story and my experience and I can respect it. And that like publishing this book, it's, there's going to be fallout. There's going to be massive, massive fallout from revealing these secrets that I was told never to repeat to. You dis described the temple ceremony in detail. Like I mean, I talk about my experience firsthand mm -hmm. yeah. and it's obviously causing a lot of uproar and problems because I am now being sued by the church. And that's why I have my best friend and legal representation here in case I say anything that could possibly, uh, you know, put me into, into any further deep water with the church. But yeah, once uh, I set out to trademark all of the stuff for Bad Mormon and the, that the but book's been getting a lot of buzz. You know, New York Times came out, spent the day with me, oh, wow. did a full photo spread. Have they published the article yet? No, they're oh. publishing. It'll come out, the print article on the 5th, and then... It'll, it'll be published by the time this airs. Oh, wow. So that Read was the huge. New York Times yeah. Review. And like all the TV shows are featuring oh. me. I'm the number one uh, book right now in religious leaders' biographies. So I'm a religious leader on Amazon. <laughs> but we've been in the top 100 since the and it's since it got released. And, and that's I'm sure -sales, that's all pre sales. That's all wow. pre orders. So oh. I want to say thank you to the ex Mormon Reddit oh. and to the Mormon Stories community because their pre orders have made all the difference, oh. you know, and ordering and buying this book is giving visibility, not just to my story, but to all of our stories. And so much so that the church is suing us. Mm. And Casey, am I going to be in Popper's prison? Pop <laughs> <laughs> and Dre, you look different. Dre, yes. you're so handsome. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So Heather, who, or do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah. Well, I just want to say thank you for cl calling me your best friend first and then lawyer. <laughs> that's, that's the way I feel about it. That would yeah. be the best friend. That's how I feel I about our relationship too. I'm grateful to be able to do your legal work as well. And how long ago was it? About six, seven years ago when yeah. you first called me about a trademark dispute. We were two moms getting harangued by all of the male plastic surgeons in town. Every doctor's office was calling us, harassing us, sending division of professional licenses. They're trying to get us shut down because we were two moms trying to start a business and they were infringing on our trademark. We had invented the mini lip plump and they were all trying to use it and to appropriate it as their own source. So we were recommended Casey as an attorney. And when we called him, we heard his voice. It was just on a, a speakerphone. I thought he was like 45 with like a pipe and like a cravat because he <laughs> speaks with such a, you know, he just has this austere, reverent tone. And we explained to him our situation and we had been rebuffed by most people just like so you made up a cute little name, mini lip plump and other doctors are using it. This is the business. It's a saturated market. Give up your hopes, you know, but we felt strongly that we needed an advocate. And you know how we've always heard the savior will be our advocate at the Lord's tribunal, God's tribunal. And Casey really stepped in. We had this call with him. We presented our case and I, of course, started crying. You're very passionate about your trademarks. And he responded and said, yeah, this isn't right. He's like, you guys, this is your business. You're two, you know, moms that have other distractions and these guys shouldn't be bullying you. They shouldn't be doing this. And I will absolutely help you out. And, um, I'm here for you. And like, mm -hmm. He advocated for us and he legally fought those trademarks. And that's been the one defining factor in our business is that we have owned all of our trademarks because he has protected us so well. Mm. And it made us be the biggest disruptor of the med spa industry scene in Salt Lake in the last 10 years. Mm. And he's had to not only file trademarks internationally, but you know, fight a lot of disputes to protect us. And he's absolutely become one of my greatest advocates, friends, and protector. He does my housewife contracts. He is, he could be a talent agent if he wanted to, but everyone that meets him is like, I love your attorney. Mm. He's kind, he's smart, he's honest. And then I always add, and he never loses. He has a perfect <laughs> record. So perfection is attainable if you're Casey Jones. Well, thank you. That's very kind, mm. but I'm also honored to, to be your lawyer and to have... I've watched Heather's journey and I'm happy to be here today. And I'm so happy for you and the book that you've, mm. you've written, how far you've come in your journey. So tell us how the Mormon church legal disputes and bad Mormon are all converging. We're dying to hear inquiring minds want to know <laughs> what's going on. Do you want me to, I want you to take okay, this. Well, yeah. So yeah, we, uh, when Heather, 
uh, decided she wanted to write a book. We uh, filed for, for a trademark, uh, the Bad Mormon trademark with the United States Patent and Trademark Office. We filed it for um, a podcast, for, for merch, um, clothing, and it sailed through the USPTO's office. It was approved for publication. The USPTO did not find uh, any issues with the application because the USPTO has examining attorneys when you file a trademark that will review the, the current uh, trademark registrations, make sure there's no... Uh, they call it a likelihood of confusion that's not not identical to another trademark that's already filed. And so we passed that process and it was published for opposition. Third parties have 30 days to oppose a trademark registration. And I was not expecting any, any opposition, but uh, the Mormon church, uh, which goes by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints by that name. Who has also condemned the usage of the term Mormon. Exactly. If you use the word Mormon, it's a victory for Satan, unless you, <laughs> but they still want to be the only ones to make money off the word Mormon. <laughs> so they, the, the church, Mormon church, filed an opposition uh, to block uh, the bad Mormon trademark, claiming a likelihood of confusion <laughs> with the Mormon uh, name. I mean, you, Russell and Nelson, I see those similarities. I see well, I mean, I, I feel like if they want... To put me on the general board, <laughs> go for it. <laughs> and that was our response. Is the, the Mormon church doesn't even want to be uh, known as the Mormons. They want to be called the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And bad Mormon is a pretty clear parody <laughs> of uh, the Mormon church. And their response to that is, well, we... We, uh, we, we invite good Mormons and bad Mormons to, to our church. And so that's, that's why people might get confused by the name. Oh, okay. It's a pretty big stretch. And, mm. uh, so that's where we're at right now. And, and I don't know if you want to talk about this, but does, does the Book of Mormon as a text and historicity and fiction versus truth, does any of that play into your legal machinations <laughs> or do you no comment? Uh, it, it is interesting the way... Uh, the complaint is is worded with respect to the whether it's a historical or fictional book. Of course, the church takes the position that it's a historical book, and uh, it's named after a historical prophet. Um, but I, I don't know if we'll, if we'll get into that uh, dispute in the in this litigation. But that has. But I think it does beg the up. question. You know, I'm trying to do write a, a lot of books. We're doing a bad Mormon cookbook. We're doing bad missionary position about the mission. I'm going to get really into the divorce in my next book. Like, this isn't the first bad Mormon book I'm going to write. This is the crumb coat. And I'm going to have a patisserie, just like the ones on my mission in France. Yeah. It's, it's so I need to own this name and trademark this name. And I know the importance of that. So we're going to fight. And do you think how, like, does the church intend to just fight this to the end? Uh, they've made it very clear that they do not want Heather to get the trademark bad Mormon. So they're afraid. Yeah. They're afraid of you. So how do we, what's the most important thing for us to do? Buy the book. Should everyone buy the book? Yes, if you want to really stick it to the church. Pre-order. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Well, Casey, thanks. Thanks yes. so much for fighting. I, I can't see any reason why the church should object to this name being used other than they don't want to face the PR of your success. Because like, I think I read in the book, you're not, you're still a member of record or did you resign? Uh, the paper, we've already filed the paperwork, but it hasn't come back okay. yet. Because I was going to ask you whether you feared excommunication. Um, but you're the one that told me they don't excommunicate famous people. They don't excommunicate famous people because they don't want to face the PR wrath of having done it. So there's something about this book and about the trademark and about the trajectory, I think, that's happening right now with this, because we're also doing the Bad Mormon documentary and really giving visibility to, you know, this community that has been rejected and silenced, absolutely silenced. So Casey's going to be our advocate. He's been our attorney through Beauty Lab and Laser and really fought for us. He's going to be our advocate for the book. And, you know, I'm not going anywhere. And I just found my voice and just respected my story. Now I've got a thousand variations to tell. Yeah. So I think that it, it will hopefully be um, a topic of conversation for a lot of people to kind of shine light on the fact that there's an institution, you know, 
that's persecuting, like something that's clearly not confusing to a good Mormon. If you're a good Mormon, don't buy this book. <laughs> that's that's yeah. ultimately what it'll come down to, the, the case. You know, will people actually think that bad Mormon is was uh, is produced it? by the, the Mormon church? <laughs> and is really there any connection? And well, the connection, it is it contains only facts. Did you guys read one thing <laughs> in the book that was not absolutely factual about mm -hmm. the church? Yeah. I mean, it's... No. A hundred percent true. Yeah. You yes. know, yeah. So there's we're, we're zero com, lies. We're confident that will prevail. Yeah. You know, we, may, we may have to get expert opinions to get surveys and ask people if, if they see any yeah. association between her book and the, and the Mormon religion. And I, I'm so as far as our that. audience goes, other than buying the book, is there anything we have a pretty awesome audience. So is there anything our legions can do to help or just buy the book? And I just want to say thank you. They've already done enough just by the support they've shown me, you know, it, it really was the turning point in so many ways. You ha that's why the book ended that way. And that community, I know it reads like it's housewife fans, but it's really just visibility, yeah. you know? And I think people find that on the ex-Mormon Reddit. I think people find it in the Mormon stories comments. I think, I don't know if you just delete all the hateful ones no. to keep it positive, but that's the only social media I look at because it's my people. And I trust and love them now. And I want to celebrate my life with them and mourn with the, them and, you know, stand yeah. and comfort them in times of comfort and all the yeah. things that I pledge to do as a good Mormon. I want to do that now with my bad Mormon peeps. That's a beautiful part of the book. Um, I have a couple questions just to end, but Margie, is there anything about the book you want to ask or say before we do a couple closing questions? Um, maybe I'll wait to see what those questions okay. are to see if, okay. yeah. So how many of the most successful real housewives, you know, franchise that there is, I don't know which one, which one is that? I think right now it's probably Salt Lake city. Oh, I don't well, know. In terms of like number of seasons. <laughs> oh, um, probably OC was the original and they are starting season 15, I believe. So you guys years. could go more than a dozen seasons potentially. That was going to be Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of them are like in their eighth or ninth, 10th. Okay. Wow. And is there, did you say a fourth has been purchased? Or? A fourth is, a fourth is rumored to begin. Okay. I mean, okay. I think fourth has been announced, but not the full okay. cast yet. And that should be filming in the next few weeks. Okay. And you said you're down to four cast members right now. We are. Yeah. Okay. And so will there, could there be new cast? Yeah, members? they have to. I mean, okay. you can't, you can't fight enough with four. You know, it's not a real melee unless there's six or seven. Did Angie is Harrington, is that her name? Angie Harrington, yeah. She she was, she's been a friend of, and okay. I don't know if she'll okay. continue to. I okay. mean, she's, you should get her, her on Mormon Stories. She's a hoot. Angie, you're welcome. Also, I, I was, love I her. Love to, I, I don't know if you know this. I grew up with Justin Rose. Yeah, I've, played, I've mentioned to them several times. Yeah, yeah. well, maybe it's, this isn't their thing, but it'd be fun to interview Justin and or Whitney and have them tell their story. Yeah. But... Well, if we, if Heather Gay is what we get. <laughs> if I'm your only ecstatic. Mormon stories we're housewives. Ecstatic. Okay. All right. Well, um, I, I guess that's the main, the main question I had besides help uh, having you plug everything that you want to plug. I mean, I wanted to have like a bad Mormon shirt and a bad Mormon hat. So like Listen, merch, we do have merch. merch coming. It could be um, seized by the feds because of the okay. trademark infringement. But yeah, we have merch, bad Mormon merch. And I was actually wearing it. Um, I was in Toronto and I was wearing my sweats. You know, they're these comfy Sunday sweats that were selling to all the bad Mormons out there. Do and you own badmormon.com? Do we? Casey, do we own it yet? Oh my goodness. I better go <laughs> grab it before we air this. I'm glad we're not airing it. I know we've registered it. I don't know okay. if it's official. Okay. But um, where would people buy your merch? Oh, they can go to uh, um, Beauty Lab, right? Where do they buy the Bad Mormon merch? Um, it's going to be. Oh, it's going to be linked through my Instagram. You can go to my Instagram to buy the merch. What's your Instagram? Heather Gay. Okay. Just at Heather Gay. Okay. And we'll have it available online too, because we're not going anywhere. But I was wearing the sweatshirt and I was in security line at, in Calgary, Canada. And this woman said to me, this little lady, nice lady said, what does your sweatshirt say? And I said, oh, it says bad Mormon. And she goes, oh, well, I'm a good one. And I bet you are too. And she just spontaneously Aww. hugged me and, you know... At first I laughed and then I cried, you know, it's just so conflicted. And then I get, I arrive, that was in Toronto. Then I arrive in Calgary and I'm going through customs and the guy asked me why I'm there and he sees my sweatshirt and I said, well, I'm an author. I wrote a book. And, uh, he said, 
did you bring any alcohol or tobacco into the country or whatever? And he said, you know, bad Mormon. And he said, is your book uplifting? And I said, you know, I don't know. For me, it was uplifting to write. I loved being a Mormon for a long time. And he's like, but not anymore. And I said, not anymore. And he sent me through, stamped my passport and then handed it to me and said, this is in Canada, in Calgary. He said, my brother's a bishop in Ogden. Mm. And I just thought, are you a bad Mormon or a good Mormon? I have to know. <laughs> Identify me. yourself. But I just, I don't want to, I just walked, I just laughed because you can never escape it. And that's the community that I love. I love that when those people say to me, hey, I'm a good one, but you know, go with God. <laughs> the truth is all Mormons are bad Mormons. Because well, no one Read can the book up. and you'll see. <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, even the best Mormons are bad Mormons. And that's the beauty the liberating element of your book is that it's about self-acceptance. It's about unconditional love. It's about authenticity and vulnerability. And I hope women know it's about second chances and honoring, honoring the choices and the sacrifices we made and not blaming ourselves for them and not feeling ashamed. It's about, you know, it's about being rejected, but then finding your voice and never giving up. You know, I have a few good years left <laughs> and if it's not too late for me, it's not too late for anyone. So I hope a lot of women, Mormon women read this book and feel seen. I can absolutely envision that. Did you feel seen sure. when you read it, Margie? I related a lot to this, to your book and to your story, a hundred percent. So, um, I did have a question just in closing, you know, you mentioned earlier what it meant for you to be able to be on Mormon Stories and to speak your story. I'm curious what it's meant for you, you know, to write it, to have to, there's a, there's a lot that you revisit about your life, mm -hmm. tender moments, beautiful moments, um, hopes you had. And, and I think on a level, we, I, what I hear from you is how much you value what's true um, but there, there's some innocence, right, that we lose as we kind of move toward reality, like yeah. what is true. So what is what was it like for you to actually relive some of these things and to write it down? And now to be like releasing, it's like a, it's like a it's baby, like having a, baby a, a yeah. little bit to the world. Um, what would you say about that? It feels, I'm so proud of it. It feels real. It feels credible. It feels like what... I was born to do, it feels like I want to shout it from the rooftops. I want everyone in my life who has ever heard of me or loves me or is a family member, knows my family to read it. My greatest fear used to be that my family would read it. And now my greatest fear is that they won't because I don't want anyone to think it came from a poisoned well, you know, so therefore it's not good. I'm a writer. And because I went on this show, it gave me the opportunity to write and it is the first time I've ever been able to like express who I am and have and hold it in my hands. And I'm afraid for the fallout, but I'm deeply, deeply proud. It feels like a creation, you know, my children and then this book. Yes. yes. My business and this book. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> You've created that quite so very much that way too, creating something, you know, yeah. that was real and is going to, you know, give me a, a legacy I can be proud of. Yeah. Yeah. Well, can I just say it's been an absolute gift to be immersed and live a little bit Thank of, your, of your story. <laughs> we celebrate you and honor you. Yeah. Thank you so, so much. Yeah. The book is Bad Mormon by Simon & Schuster, a memoir by Heather Gay. Uh, please buy uh, copies Buy it for friends, buy it for family members, buy it for loved ones, buy it for non-Mormons. Let's sell this book the F out all over the world. <laughs> First of all, that's Bad Mormon. Casey's applauding. Um, <laughs> so that's the book. Uh, the Instagram is at Heather Gay. At and Heather we're having Gay. a big book party um, on February 11th. Like it's the, we can't call it happy hour because we live in Utah, but it's just a huge meet and greet an evening with Heather Gay. I'm going to read a few things. We're going to have merch. It's going to be the, like a thrive event, hopefully. Oh, so we want all the thrive to come and uh, come to the bad Mormon book party and let's celebrate our communal visibility <laughs> together because we exist. We are here and we're not going anywhere. And for those who need some lip enhancement or uh, 
Um, so maybe some a mini uh, cosmetics. Lip, a, a mini lip, a mini lip plump I'm trademark. I'm really enjoying you. <laughs> I don't know what to call it. It's called a mini lip Botox, plump whatever. or a cheekbone pop or thigh bella, banana bella. Oh, shot. We have a myriad of, <laughs> of trademarked out-based services. You can but that's go to. Beauty Lab and Laser. And, and we have two in, locations. In Murray? In Murray on 9th East and in Riverton. And we're very, very proud of our business. That's been the vehicle to get us on Housewives and to get this book written and it's really the source of our greatest fulfillment, I think. Mm. And Real Housewives of Salt Lake can be found? It's on Bravo TV. You can watch it if you're so inclined. But All I'll right. be your favorite. Yeah. I'm just kidding. <laughs> you are the official fan favorite. At least uh, that's true. You know, it comes and goes. No one gets through unscathed. <laughs> but, um, these, you know, Salt Lake City's my town. So <laughs> I should be, you know, I feel very comfortable here. Heather, you are not just fun, not just entertaining. You are wise and uh, caring and loving and um, deep yeah. and courageous and real. And I am just honored to know you, Dre. You've, you're off camera. I'm honored to know you. You are special friends to me, even though you're too busy to hang out. I don't, I don't. <laughs> we have done brunch. <laughs> we have done brunch. I, I hold that. No, you're a little, little, just a little I busy, busy as well. Too, yeah. <laughs> yes. But um, I adore you too. And we are just cheer. We got yeah. you. I know. I feel it. As much as we can have you. And we're going to be cheering you on. Thank you. This so, is the most important interview I've done. Oh. And I'm so grateful to be back. Yeah. And, and come back again. I will. All I right. will. Thank you so much. Thanks, Heather. Please buy the book, Bad Mormon. Thanks, Casey. Thank you. Yep. Here, Casey, hold the book. <laughs> Thank you. Casey. Buy the book. <laughs> All right. All right, Margie, thanks, oh. for, thanks for joining us, Margie. We love you. My pleasure. Thanks, uh, thanks again. And uh, thanks for joining us today on Mormon Stories. Go to mormonstories.org if you want to support what we do. Become a monthly donor. But don't worry about that. Support Heather Gay. Buy this book. And let's spread the word because this book will probably touch more hearts and minds than Mormon stories ever could. So support it. Love you, Heather. Thank you. Keep up the good Thank work. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll see you all again soon on another episode of Mormon Stories Podcast. Take care, everybody.